Okay, VTs. I'm going really fast, but it's a lot, a lot to cover. A way to um, basically classify them, structure a normal heart. There are certain VTs that occur in normal heart, typically in young individuals. And the more common scenario are scar-related uh, VTs. Structure in normal hearts typically are non-reentrant, they tend to be focal. <clears throat> and scar-related are usually re-entry uh, that occur the scar as the diastolic pathway of conduction. Typically, you will have a QRS when, it, when the electricity exits the scar, and then you, as it exits, it generates a QRS and then re-enters their scar at another location. During the diastolic interval, you get electricity go, traveling through the scar. You don't see that on the EKG, but it's going on there. And then it exits the scar. And that most commonly is infarct-related, but also can occur in other other inflammatory diseases that can lead to residual scars. Sarcoid is the most common, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, giant cell myocarditis, or idiopathic. Bundle branch reentry is an interesting tachycardia that occurs in the, cent in the setting of typically non ischemic cardiomyopathy with very dilated cardiomyopathic hearts that have infrahesian conduction disease, and our electricity <coughs> reenters from the right bundle to the left bundle, typically very fast, typically associated with syncope not associated with SCAR, and monomorphic, of course, typically has a, a completely typical left bundle branch block morphology, most commonly, but also may have a right bundle branch morphology, depending on the, on the direction of the reentry. And the treatment is very simple because we ablate the right bundle, and it's taken care of. Polymorphic forms of tachycardia, most commonly in the context of acute ischemia <coughs> uh, or long QT, or as I will exp explain a few examples, calcium driven in the setting of, of the juxtaposition toxicity, or a condition called catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is bidirectional. Okay, let's just go over examples of this. All right, so you have here a run of white complex tachycardia, a few bits of what appear to be sinus with a T wave and a non relatively normal QRS. You notice that the, the salvos of BT are irregular and have a uh, polymorphic nature. And you see you start with positive QRS and then it turns to be negative. Key here, the QT is very long. If you look at the beat, this sign of beat, the QT is so long, you don't even see the end, you get a PVC after. Um, so this is what you will see. This is polymorphic BT in the context of long QT. It also always tends to happen in um, long, short sequences. When you have a long interval, long, bit to bit interval, you will have this peak that follows the long R interval will have a massively prolonged QT. So when you have long QT, yes, it's long all the time, but it's particularly long after pauses. And it's after pauses when you have the massively prolonged QT that you will have an early after depolarization triggering uh, polymorphic VT. Uh, you want to catch it in that, in that scenario, not but be before it deteriorates to, um, to um, VF. Because what you can do, the most, the most uh, effective way to treat polymorphic VT in the setting of long QT, sure, you're going to give magnesium and all those things that make you feel good, but that doesn't take you anywhere. What you need to do is prevent those pauses. And how do you prevent those pauses? By accelerating the heart rate. A quick thing to start is isoprotenol. The most effective is to just pace those hearts. You want to put a temporary wire and pace them at 100. You will prevent those pauses. You will control these fluctuations of the QT interval. You're going to read in the guidelines how to manage uh, VT. This is, this is something you can, mon you can memorize if you want, and you will forget it as soon as you memorize it. Key things is remember and understand. Whatever you understand, you will remember, right? So basic things, regular or irregular. If it's irregular, obviously you have to think of AFib, perhaps with aberrancy or with an accessory pathway. <clears throat> if it's regular, you want to make sure that you compare with this with the baseline uh, EKG. Make sure the sinus EKG doesn't look exactly the same because if it does, then it's probably aberrancy. Uh, or if you have an accessory pathway in the baseline, you have to think of antidromic AVRT. Then you look at uh, P waves. You have to find the P waves if if they are there and discern the a, the AV relationship. If you have AV dissociation, you have VT. Obviously, when the V rate is faster than the A rate. A rate faster than the V rate, that's obviously not VT. Um, and then when you can't see the P waves, you cannot be certain about AV dissociation is when it gets tricky 
and you have to look at the morphology criteria for VT versus SVT, which I urge you to memorize and I will show you. These are things that it's helpful to memorize and then forget, and some residual uh, facts will stay in your mind and be useful every now and then. You need to understand how a typical left bundle branch looks like and how a typical right bundle branch looks like uh, in aberrancy, and then see if they match what you're looking at. Several algorithms, let me just uh, show you how this works. A few things that are typical of VT, okay? When you don't have an RS complex in all the precordial leads, right? You are, by, by RS complex, you have to have a comparable amplitude R wave, a comparable amplitude S wave throughout V1 and through V6, all right? If you don't have that, that suggests VT. If from the onset of the R to the nadir of the S, it takes a long time, that's consistent with VT as well. AV dissociation is VT. And then the morphology criteria is when they play a role. All right. Um, again, what you need to understand is that what a typical left bundle branch looks like. <coughs> typical left bundle branch plot will have a very narrow or no R wave in V1. If you have a fat R wave in V1, more than 30 milliseconds, that's consistent with VT. That's all you need to memorize because the morphology criteria for V6 is just the opposite. All right? V6, you have a very small Q when you have a typical left bundle branch block. And if the Q is bigger than too small, then it's consistent with VT. As simple as that. For right bundle branch block, you know, we talk about the rabbit ears uh, in, in, in V1, in right bundle branch block in aberrancy. The second rabbit ear is taller than the first one. If you don't have that, then you have to think of VT. As simple as that. And you can, you can uh, memorize more details. But I tend to forget every, anything that I don't understand. So it just, it just, it's simple to understand things. And these are different variants of the algorithm. Just think, when you have slurred QRS in V1, or in, in, the, in, in, the, in a white complex tachycardia, it's either you have an accessory pathway and you have antidromic tachycardia, which will look exactly like a VT, um, or VT. If you don't have that slurring, it's probably more likely to be SVT. Okay, these are examples. White complex tachycardia. You got a right bundle branch block. The second rabbit ear is much taller than the first rabbit ear. Okay, that could be typical um, aberrancy in, which, in this case, but you look at the, the baseline EKG, and this is a patient with Epstein's anomaly, I think, and you have a very wide right bundle branch block in sinus, just the same as the tachycardia. So it's very important to have uh, access to the baseline EKG. All right, there are another white complex tachycardia. Left bundle branch block pattern. You don't have an RS complex anywhere in, in the precordial leads, right? Either you have a deep Qs or just Rs, but you don't have an RS uh, complex anywhere. And if you look in detail here, can see how there's variations on the ST segment. Those are the P waves. So you have AV dissociation. That's VT, all right? Um, same thing. You have to find the P wave when you can. This is an example I showed you earlier. When a white complex tachycardia becomes narrow without interruption, that says VT, OK? Um, examples of normal heart. This is a tachycardia right bundle branch block pattern with a left anterior fascicular block, right? Small Rs in two and deep S's in 2-3 AVF. Right bundle branch block, normal heart disease, a, patient, a young patient uh, with uh, syncope. And you have this beat. What is this beat? An arrow beat. That's a capture beat. Excellent. So that's evidence of AV dissociation. The, the patient happened to have a P wave that was able to sneak into the AV node and, and generate a normal QRS in the middle throughout the ongoing VT. So that's an example of VT. This is an example of fascicular tachycardia. You have to remember, this is one of those examples of normal, structurally normal hearts that have VT. This is uh, um, an abnormal mechanism called verapamil sensitive VT or Belhassen's VT. It originates from the left posterior fascicle. And that's why it has a right bundle branch block, left anterior fascicular block pattern. Okay, next. Another example, young individual goes, drinks alcohol, maybe exercises, 
and then has this tachycardia, has a left bundle branch block pattern with very positive uh, QRSs in 2, 3, and AVF. You have to think of, go back, please. You have to think, go back, back, back. You have to think of right ventricular outflow tract tachycardia. For whatever reason, we don't know. The outflow tracts of the right ventricle and the left ventricle tend to be very prone to having a focal uh, VTs in normal hearts. In young individuals, we see them as, as uh, typical RVOT VTs that occur after alcohol or after exercise. In elderly, or this typically all the women, they, they present as PVCs, isolated PVCs. And it's usually from the RV, RV outflow tract, sometimes from the LV outflow tract. Okay, next. This is a patient with syncope during exercise. Pay attention, you have two forms of QRSs, all right? So we have QRS alternance. This is a form of uh, bidirectional tachycardia. In this case, both QRSs have right bundle branch block morphology, and one has left anterior fascicular block, the other has left posterior fascicular block. This is typical of CPVT, catecholaminergic polymorphic VT. Also, you could see this with digoxin toxicity. It's a calcium-driven arrhythmia uh, due to delayed after depolarization due to calcium overload. The more common scenario is what we see uh, in EP practices, patients with uh, a previous infarct. In this case, this is a map of the voltage, the size of the local electrograms in this area. This is the left ventricle, looking at it from a kind of a right posterior oblique view. This is the microlinus, it will be the aortic annulus, and this is the patient has a big septal scar. This is another view, inferior view, this is the entire inferior wall, all scarred. Red means local voltage less than 0.5 uh, millivolts, and you have VT. And if we record signals from the middle of the scar, you will see, I don't know if I have it on the slide, you will see electric electricity that, uh, that's happening in between the QRSs. And that is why we call, this is scar-related uh, re-entry, and when we ablate those, those areas that sustain the diastolic component of the tachycardia, we eliminate the tachycardia. And yeah, this is what I was talking about. So this is a signal taken from ablation catheter when you put the ablation in location one. It's in diastole, but close to the QRS. When we put it in location two, it is these complex signals that take a long time uh, basically illustrating the slow conduction that goes on during the scar. We ablate those areas and we take care of them. And I think uh, I'm going to jump to the uh, atrial fibrillation presentation.